Welcome to our 1030 press conference. This morning we'll be speaking about the Mars Rover Opportunities Investigations at Endeavor Crater. Our speakers in this order are Diana Blaney, she's Deputy Project Scientist for Opportunity at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and Steve Squires, he's Principal Investigator for Opportunity. He's from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Um, I'm very happy to be here to talk about opportunity. Um, since landing on July 25th in 2004, we've spent the last nine years extending a 90-day mission exploring the Meridiani region of Mars. Um, during that time, opportunities tra traveled 22 miles and arrived at Endeavour Crater in August of 2011 after almost a three-year trek from Victoria Crater. Um, during, since arriving at Endeavour, um, Opportunity has been exploring the Cape York region of, on the rim of Endeavour and has survived its fifth Martian winter um, there. Um, the rover's physical state is unchanged. Um, we've got recurrent IDD, which is our arm joint problems and a right front wheel um, actuator that's not working well, but we have engineering workarounds that have allowed us to continue um, dealing with these issues. Um, the current payload available to explore the Cape York region are the Alpha Proton X-ray spectrometer, which measures elemental composition, the rack abrasion tool, which uh, drills into the rock, and the camera suite, which includes a panoramic camera, a microscopic imager, and navigation cameras that are used for driving. And I'd like to turn it over to Steve to talk about what we've discovered there. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back here doing another press briefing at AGU. I think this is the ninth one of these that we've done. I didn't think we would do two, but here we are. So, as Diana mentioned, uh, we are now exploring the rim of Endeavour Crater. Endeavour is fundamentally different from every other crater that we have looked at with opportunity. For one thing, it's big. It's 22 kilometers in diameter. It's much larger than anything that we've looked at before. But more importantly, it's old. All of the other craters that we've looked at were little craters that punched into these sulfate-rich sandstones that Opportunity was driving around on for most, most of its mission. What's different about Endeavour, Endeavour is older than those sandstones. And what happens is you've got this great big crater that's mostly buried by the sandstones. And then you have the rim of the crater rising up through the sandstones like, like islands in a sea of sulfates and, and rising above that. And you can see in this picture here, this is uh, Cape York. Uh, this is a segment of the rim of Endeavour Crater uh, that Opportunity has been driving around on. Now, last year at AGU, we reported on our initial findings uh, from the rim of Endeavour. And what we found was kind of exactly what you would expect to find uh, on a crater rim. You find a lot of really busted up rocks. These are rocks that uh, planetary geologists would call a breccia. And they are the result of the impact event itself. Impacts are very violent. They break rocks up. And so you find these deposits of chunks of rock that were fragmented by the impact kind of fused together. What drew us, however, to Endeavour was something different. It was discovered several years ago by looking at data from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter CRISM infrared spectrometer that there are clay minerals in the rim of Endeavour Crater. Now, clays are tremendously important on Mars. Clays form in a watery environment. That's important. But even more important is the fact that clay will only form under a kind of a neutral pH, water that's not acid. Now, we've been driving around for years on sulfate-rich sandstones that formed in a watery environment, but those sulfate minerals tell us of a different pH. It was a low pH. It was an acidic environment. People run around saying, water on Mars, water on Mars. Well, at Meridiani, it was really sulfuric acid on Mars. Okay, But in the rim of Endeavour, where we see the signature of these clay minerals, it points towards a different story. 
an older time, an earlier time, when the water was not acid, and when you might have had conditions because it was not acid that would have been more suitable for life. Now, the way I've, th the way I've always thought about this clay signature, <clears throat> you can think of it as being kind of a chemical beacon visible from space saying, hey, this is an interesting place to go. And it was that chemical beacon that drew us to the rim of Endeavor Crater. Now, when we arrived at Endeavor, we first pulled up to these rocks that were these, these impact breaches, and they told an interesting story, but it wasn't the clay story that we were looking for. And so what we've done, and this is some very nice work done by Ray Arvidson on our team, is try to refine our understanding of that orbital data set and pinpoint the exact location on Cape York, this one segment of the rim of Endeavor that we've been exploring, where the clays are found. We have found it. The place is called Matijevich Hill. Uh, it's named after Jake Matijevich, who was a beloved member of the MER project family for many years, who passed away recently. Uh, Jake played just a, a fundamental role in the Mars Pathfinder rovers, in uh, the MER ro Mars Pathfinder rover, uh, the MER rovers, and also Curiosity. And to, to honor Jake's memory, we have named this place Matijevich Hill. And what you're seeing, you can see a 20-meter scale bar down towards the, the bottom left of this, and you can see the exploration that we've conducted so far of Matijevich Hill. This is the sweet spot. This is the place where the orbital data tells us that the clays are present. Now, we've been driving around on Cape York for better, better than a year. We've been seeing these impact breaches. And then, as we began to approach Matijevich Hill, we started seeing stuff that looked really, really different. And this was our first view. Uh, this shows the, the, the two primary rock types that we've now come to realize are present at Matijevich Hill. You can see, I'll zoom in on a portion of it. What you can see is there's, there's two materials here. The dominant one, the stuff that covers most of the real estate of Matijevich Hill, is light-toned, flat-lying, easily eroded by Martian wind, and we believe that that is the material that contains the clays. And I'll show you a close-up of that in just a moment. And then, sticking up through it in places are chunks of another type of material that's dark, that's gray, that's more resistant to erosion. And you can see it sort of sticking up, kind of forming like a, a fin kind of deposit here. And we see these, we see these, these dark gray uh, uh, materials in a number of different places. And I'll show you what that looks like close up in a minute. Okay, now what I'm going to do here, I want to make clear what I'm trying to, to, to do for you today. We have been exploring at Matijevich Hill for a little while now. We've done that loop. We've done a sort of a, we call it a walk around. We've done a, a look around uh, this, this region. But we are far from being done with our investigation here. What we have stumbled upon here at Matijevich Hill, drawn by that clay signature, is what is turning out to be one of the most delightful geologic puzzles that we have ever found with this rover on Mars. It's fascinating. It's a work in progress. So what I'm going to do for you here is imagine I'm going to, we're, we're partway through our field expedition here. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to crack open my field notebook, and I'm going to show you what we got so far. OK? So two primary geologic units. This one is a rock that we've named Whitewater Lake. And Whitewater Lake is representative of these light-toned uh, rocks that cover most of this region and that we are really quite confident must be the material that contains the clays. It is the dominant rock type in this area. It is right in the sweet spot of where the, where the clay signature is present. So this has got to be the clay bearing stuff. Now when we look at this in detail with all our tools, we see some, some interesting characteristics. One is that this rock is very, very fine grained. Another is that it's extremely soft. We know this by using our rock abrasion tool. We can grind into this stuff, and it just eats away at it, just easy as can be. So this is very fine-grained, very soft. When we look at its elemental chemistry, there's nothing unusual about it. What's unusual is that it's not unusual. 
<laughs> it, this puzzled us at first because, you know, I was expecting to see something dramatic. And instead, what you see here, it kind of looks like average Mars. It just looks like average Martian material in terms of the elements that are present. So what this says is that it's a fairly representative unit of, of, of the planet. Um, you also see that in this region here, there's a coating. It shows up as kind of a grayer. This is a false color image. It's almost a bluer looking unit. And this false color, if you looked at it with your eyes, it would look grayer. Uh, there's this resistant coating on top of this stuff. Uh, it's seen all over this area. We've measured the composition of this as well. It looks very similar to the stuff underneath, except it is more rich in sulfur and chlorine and a little bit more rich in calcium. So what that says is that this probably has some salts in it. There is some process operated here that's produced this, this coating on top of the rock that seems to be rich in perhaps sulfate and, and chloride salts. So this is, this is the dominant unit here. And I, 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 once I get through all of this, I will tell you what we're going to do next uh, to, to figure out better what this means. But we're, we're really quite confident uh, that this must be the clay bearing unit because it's, it's just exactly uh, in the right spot. And the elemental chemistry is, is certainly consistent with clays being present. So that was the, that was the sort of su surprising part. Now I'll get to the really surprising part. We, we drove up to this, this fin, this gray thing that was sticking up, and we took images of it with our microscopic imager, and we saw this. Now, I, this is a micro, this picture taken with a microscopic imager. This is about five centimeters across. It's a mosaic of a couple of images. And when I saw this for the first time, I thought, ah, blueberry pie. That's got to be what it is. Um, you're, you're probably familiar if you followed the mission with the fact that out on the plains where we've been operating for a long time, there are these hematite concretions in the rock that we've nicknamed blueberries. And they're made of hematite, which is an iron-bearing mineral. And uh, they're, they're small, they're round, they look a lot like this. And I saw this, I thought, wow, this is an intense concentration of hematite blueberries. We measured the composition of this stuff, and it ain't hematite. These are something totally different. I've been calling them new berries because they're something new. And I don't know what they are. Um, we have several different working hypotheses for what these might be. They could be concretions of another sort that is stuck together with a small concentration, a low concentration of some mineral that we have not identified yet. Uh, they could be what are called impact spherules. Uh, when you have an impact and you have impact ejecta that are thrown out, you can get little uh, spherical uh, accumulations of impact debris that can, can look very much like this. They could be, what are, if this is a volcanic deposit, they could be what are called accretionary lapilli. Lapilli are little, like little volcanic hailstones. Uh, Pompeii is buried in this stuff. Okay, so we've got a bunch of different hypotheses for what this might be. The reason that we don't know the composition of this stuff yet is because these things are small. They're only about three millimeters or so in size, and we are unable, because of the size of our alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, to isolate a single one of these. So we're going to have to use a trick to figure out the composition of these things. So that's what we've got so far. We've got this aerially extensive, probably clay-bearing, light tone stuff represented by Whitewater Lake. It is shot through with concentrations of these little new berries, sometimes in dense concentrations like we see in that fin that we named Kirkwood, other places, just a few of them through the rock. Now, once we discovered this, we then did this loop around Matijevich Hill. And it took us about six weeks to do the loop. You can see the, the path that we followed here. We did a lot of imaging as we went. And this is exactly what you would do if you were a geologist at this site. You walk up to a new location. You see, oh, we got something totally new here. So the first thing you do is you walk the outcrop. You just sort of look around and see where everything is. And so what we've got now from the imaging that we did as we did this loop is we've got a good map of where the good stuff is, where the interesting stuff is uh, at, at Matijevich Hill. So now we've made a list. We've got a to-do list of things that we want to do before we move on from Matijevich Hill 
and head to the south. So let me take you through the list. It's, it's, it's pretty short. First thing is we want to understand the Whitewater Lake unit better. We want to look at its sedimentary geology, if you will. There, this stuff is layered. We would like to look at the configuration of layering, whether there are any structures in it that point to a specific origin. Is it windblown? Is it water lane? Is it impact, emplaced, what have you? Each one of those has specific predictions for what the layering would be like, and so we can study that. Another big one is what are the new berries made of? We can actually nail this down. What we can do is we can go to a place where we have different concentrations of new berries. One place where there's a lot, another place where there's a little, another place where there's none. If we only make one compositional measurement, we can't tell what the berries themselves are made of. But if we make several, we can unmix them mathematically. And we can determine what are the compositions of both the new berries and the stuff in which they reside. Requires multiple measurements, but that's, that's a thing that we, uh, that we plan to do. And then one of the most important things <coughs> is we want to find a contact, a place where um, uh, some of the, the, the berries, or excuse me, a place where, where some of this unit, the Whitewater Lake stuff, is found in contact with the breccia deposits, the busted up rocks that I told you about earlier. I don't know right now whether these rocks, the Whitewater Lake stuff, we don't even know is this stuff younger than or older than those busted up breaches that form the crater rim. We haven't found a place where they lie together, where they contact one another. We want to know which one lies above and which one lies below. One more point, and I want to go back now and just show you one thing here. It's a little bit hard to see, uh, but if you look down towards the bottom, very, down, very close to the bottom of this particular image, you can see that there are places within the Whitewater Lake unit where there are little fine veins a very light toned stuff cutting through it. It's like there are fractures in the rock that are filled with something sort of light toned. Uh, we don't know what this stuff is. It's probably some mineral that's been deposited by water flowing through the rocks. We've seen that uh, other places. We're really eager to find out what these veins are. The problem with the veins is like the newberries, they're very small. And so we'll have to play the same trick. We'll have to play the exact same trick, find a, a place where there's a concentration of veins, make a measurement there, and then make another place measurement right next to it where there aren't any veins and then look at the difference between the two. And we hope that that will help to reveal uh, what the veins are made of. So those four things that I just listed uh, are the, the, the key things on our to-do list. And we expect to be here at Matijevich Hill for a number of months. Um, against all odds, this rover is still operating after nearly nine years. Uh, and we have fortuitously just you know, run up against what I think is one of the most interesting, most challenging, most subtle, if you will, uh, geologic problems that we have encountered the entire mission. The rover's in great shape. Uh, we have the tools that we need to figure this stuff out. We're still having a lot of fun nine years into this, and uh, stay tuned. We're going to find out a lot, a lot here. Thanks. questions? Do we have any questions here? Lots of questions. Uh, it's Jonathan Amos, uh, BBC News. Um, Steve, when we spoke at um, JPL in, in August, I wondered if opportunity would steal Curiosity's thunder at AGU. And you've touched Clay's. So, um, you know, Clay's are, are also Curiosity's uh, big goal. Won't get there for about a year, but um, You've, uh, you've done it. I mean, you've still got some work to do, obviously, but uh, um, does, does that kind of, I mean, when you go back nine years, um, as you say, it was a, what was it, a 90-day mission or something yeah, like that? 90 days. Um, and, and here you are, and, and, and you've got to touch uh, clays, which are obviously the, the rock formation that we really want to have a look at because it goes back to that, that period when, when Mars, we think, was, was, was wetter and, uh, and warmer. What can you say about what you think is going on here in terms of, I know it's difficult, but the water, the water history around here. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to resist the temptation to speculate too much here. Um, we're very much in multiple working hypothesis mode. It could be this, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. 
You know, we've got several different ideas for how the Whitewater Lake rocks formed. We have several different ideas for what the Newberries might be. And rather than sort of guess and try to prove that some guess is right, what we're trying to do right now is keep an open mind and let the rocks do the talking. And so we've got these multiple ideas. <clears throat> the nice thing about these different ideas is they all have their own predictions about what we should see. Just to, as one example. Okay, let's take the composition of the, of the newberries. One, poss one possibility is that these are impact spherules. Another possibility is that these are concretions. If they are impact spherules, they should be made of the same stuff as the matrix in which they are embedded. There shouldn't be a compositional difference. It's just the same stuff. If, on the other hand, they're concretions, there has to be some mineral which is going to be different from the composition of the stuff around it that glues the spirals together, that glues these concretions together. Okay? So we can test that hypothesis by making these multiple measurements of the composition. That's, that's just one example, and there are a whole bunch of them. So clearly this is a place where, where water was present. The fact that this is, is, you know, there's a clay mineral signature clearly says that. Clearly this is very ancient. The processes are something we're still working out. And so rather than guessing, we're going to do some geology. Then I'll tell you. I promise. Okay, David, you're next. Too busy taking notes. <laughs> yeah, this is Dave Perlman from the Chronicle in San Francisco. <clears throat> uh, talk a little bit about the how you <clears throat> know that these are clay minerals. Uh, I mean, you don't. Do you identify them by their composition? Do you identify them by the formation of the area in which they exist? Mm -hmm. How do you know it's a clay? I mean, it's been observed from. Uh, orbit, yeah. but how can you differentiate that from some other possibility? Okay, good question. Um, from orbit, we have seen the unambiguous infrared spectral signature of clays along the rim of Endeavor Crater. Now, it's a complicated data set. It's a difficult data set to work with. Uh, there are folks on the science team for CRISM who are also on our team who have worked very, very hard to analyze the data and to try to pinpoint the location where the, where the clay minerals are. And that work has been done and it shows very clearly that right where we are here, Matijevich Hill, the place where this light tone stuff shows up is exactly, exactly where the clay signature is. Okay, and you look around it and you don't see the clays, you look at this spot and you do see the clays. So, just from that, just the, that correlation, we have a unique rock type that we've never seen anywhere else. There's nothing like this anywhere else at Meridiani Planum, okay? And we got a clay signature, only one place of all the places along the traverse that we have seen it, and bang, they're right together. So to me, it's kind of an inescapable conclusion. Now, the other thing we, that, we, that we can do is we can use our alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, which tells you what elements are present, as kind of a sanity check. Okay, if the APXS tells you, you know, it tells you what chemical elements are present, and there are different mixtures of chemical elements that could be consistent with clays or inconsistent with clays. So, for example, if we looked at these rocks with the APXS, our elemental chemistry instrument, and we saw the same composition, the same kind of composition that we've been seeing out on the plains for years with 40% sulfate salts, I'd have to say, well, wait a minute, something's funny here. This isn't right. It doesn't pass a sanity check. But it passes that sanity check beautifully. So that, that, that correlation, I think, is a, is a really powerful argument. And as I said, the, the, the important thing about the clays, it's the signal that drew us here. It's the, it's the chemical beacon that pulled us to this place. Uh, and, and it was what resulted in us discovering the newberries and whatever it is those are trying to tell us about Mars. We wouldn't have been drawn to this spot had it not been for that, for that clay signal. Uh, so I feel very confident that we have arrived in the place with the clays. The orbital data alone tell us that. But what's really important here is that they've drawn us to such a, an interesting and different place. Uh, Pete Goley, Raw Story, San Francisco. When I first saw the uh, image of the newberries, uh, the, um, I think the microscopic one, it looked as if the matrix is draped over it, if you will. Can you comment on that as opposed to the blueberries in the past where they're more 
discrete uh, and separate from the matrix? No, I, don't, I wouldn't say that the matrix is draped over it. What I see is these spherical objects embedded in a matrix. Um, the spherical, the, the spheroids, the, the new berries are a little stronger than the matrix, and so the matrix erodes away faster than the, than the spherules do. But these spherules don't seem to be nearly as tough mechanically, nearly as strong as the hematite blueberries that we see out on the plains. If you look at this image, you can see ones that are busted in half. Okay, and they, one of the fascinating things, and this is another thing that's really different about the, the new berries as opposed to the blueberries, is that a lot of these things seem to have a, a hard outer shell and a softer center. They're crunchy on the outside and chewy in the middle, okay? And, and that we haven't seen before. There's a radial structure to them. Uh, and so that's, that's a clue. Um, so they, these, these things are different, but I think fundamentally what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a, a concentration of these in a matrix. One of the things that's, that's another thing that's really different about these compared to the blueberries is that when you look at the blueberries, they are dispersed through the rock, okay? And, and you can actually do mathematical analysis of the statistics of this, and what you see is that their distribution is actually more uniform than random. They're not concentrated at all. Here, you've got this fantastic concentration of these things. So whatever process we're going to invoke to form these things, it has to cause dense concentrations of these things. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a new puzzle, but like I said, these, I, I, I was just certain, I was just certain when we did our first APX measurement on this that it was come, gonna come back, you know, huge volume of, you know, huge concentration of iron because that's what hematite blueberries look like. And it ain't that, this is something totally new and different. It's kind of cool. Hi, Steve, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused about why the um, uh, why you measured average Mars when you looked at these uh, at this fine grained clay like stuff and what what were you expecting to see and why didn't you see what you expected? I, I wasn't I didn't have a specific expectation for what we were going to see. Um, Mars has surprised me enough times now that I've gotten over that. But I kind of, it, w it was such an unusual looking unit, it looks so different from what we've seen before that I kind of expected there to be something noteworthy about the chemistry. Uh, in fact, it looks very much like average Mars. Now let me, I'm going to give you a hypothesis. I'm not claiming this is the answer, but here's a hypothesis. A hypothesis is that what we're seeing here is an impact deposit, maybe from some very distant far away impact, and so what we're seeing is, is fine grain material that was transported for very long distances away from this impact. The thing about impacts is that they, you have a big rock from space that whacks into the Martian crust, it blows a big hole in it, especially if it's, it's a, a large one and it makes a large crater, the composition of the ejecta, the stuff that's thrown out, is going to be kind of an average composition for the rock that you impacted. It could look like kind of average Mars. Now you can then alter it, you can change what minerals are present, you can take uh, a, initially a, a, a basalt kind of composition and you can alter it to make clays, for example. But, um, but you're gonna get, a, you know, in a process like that, an impact process, you might get a very kind of average Mars looking composition. So that's one hypothesis. And again, I stress it's, it's only a hypothesis at this point for what we may be seeing here. But other places, at, you know, other places at Meridiani, when we first landed at Eagle Crater almost nine years ago, what did we see? We saw finely layered, light-toned sediments with dark gray round things in them. It was a lot like this. And yet when we looked at the finely layered sediments, they were 40% sulfate salts. In your face, boom, this is dramatic. Uh, we looked at the, the blueberries and they're more than 75% hematite. You know, again, dramatic, different, unusual. This is a much more subtle problem. It's, a, it's almost like we've been, you know, we've been exploring Mars for nine years now and now Mars has given us our final exam. Okay, <laughs> this is a tough one. And uh, it's a much more subtle, much more um, uh, challenging, kind of in some ways more fun problem. 
uh, than the one that we faced before. How far has the rover traveled um, since it since it landed? And um, with the the story of water on Mars has been you know very well established at this point, And I don't mean this to sound snarky, but what what else could you possibly um, kind of keep adding to the story of water on Mars by finding clays at this point? Uh, let's see, I'll turn to Diane on the yeah. distance. She's got that number better than I do. It's about 22 miles, a little over 22 miles. And, I'll, and from my perspective, it's not just the water, but what the water does. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the subtleties in the story. It's the chemistry, really. Um, what drives us to investigate the problem of water on Mars is the fact that water is a necessary condition for life. But there's water and there's water. And uh, the evidence that we've found for watery conditions here at the Opportunity site from day one has been very, very acidic. I mean, we found minerals out on the plains that only form when the pH is lower than five and typically form at a pH of three or two or one, you know, battery acid kind of kind of numbers. And that's a challenging place for life. Um, the thing that's different here is that these clay minerals point towards a neutral chemistry, water you could drink. Um, and that's, that's a different story. That's a different world. And it's, it's particularly interesting to me that that correlates with the oldest stuff that we have seen on Mars. It seems that these uh, more suitable water chemistries are concentrated. The evidence for those is concentrated in the oldest materials on Mars. So this is, this is our first glimpse ever at conditions on ancient Mars that sh clearly show us a chemistry uh, at, uh, that, that, would have been more, that would have been suitable for life um, at the Opportunity Site. And that's what make this, makes this place important, I think. We have a question uh, from Nancy Atkinson, who's with Universe Today. Uh, and the question is for you, Steve. Uh, you mentioned that you don't know yet what the new berries and veins are because they're small. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't you know yet what the clays are? Why don't we know yet what the clays are? Um, we have not yet done a thorough enough imaging analysis of the layering in the clay unit to differentiate among different hypotheses for how these materials were laid down. Um, you know, I think a big part of the story is going to be understanding the new berries. I think figuring out the new berries is going to be fundamental to understanding how this clay bearing unit was in place. You know, as I said, one of our leading hypotheses is that these are some kind of impact spherules. Uh, if that turns out to be the, the, the best explanation once we've measured their, their chemistry, then that points us in a very definite, definite direction for how the layering in the, in the clay unit and the White Water Lake stuff was produced. So it's a, the, the, the stories of, you can't, you can't look at the, the White Water Lake clays and the, the newberries independently there. I mean, one is embedded in the other. Their stories are woven together. Uh, so we, we still have homework to do there. Norm Sperling, Journal of Irreproducible Results. What would it look like if the original powdery clay dust had been sprinkled with water drops? How different would that look than these new berries? Sprinkled with water drops. Such as from a colliding comet. I don't have the slightest idea what that would look like, but um, these, are, these are hard spherical objects that um, are embedded in the rock. You've got a volumetric distribution of these things through the rock. There's nothing about this to me that points towards um, sprinkling of water on anything. I think uh, there, there's this is sort of very fundamentally different from that. Do we have other questions? <laughs> I got a bunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, a million questions. Uh, I'll start with 999,000. Um, how you have several hypotheses about how these new berries formed. Uh, the image indicates that some, at least three that I can see, are embedded in something. Uh, the ones that look as though they're busted open. 
Does that tell you anything about uh, their existence as a result of impact? What would have, or were they uncovered? Uh, yeah. Talk a little They're bit more. They're all about. embedded in something, yeah. every last one of them. Okay, they are all embedded in this matrix of fine-grained stuff. Uh, but at this location, in this image, there's an extraordinarily high concentration of them. There are other places. I mean, if you look at Whitewater Lake, you can see, look, look down towards the lower right portion of this image. You can see places where it's studded with just a small number of new berries embedded in the rock. So some places, there's a whole lot of them together. Others, there are very, very few of them, but they're still there. So these things are embedded in the rock. Um, they are a little bit stronger than the matrix in which they are found. And so what happens, what you, remember, you're seeing an eroded surface here, Dave. You're seeing a surface that has been sandblasted for a very long time. And what the sandblasting does, it does, it does two things that cause what you see in this image. One thing that it does is it erodes away the matrix a little more effectively than it erodes away the new berries themselves. And so you wind up with the new berries kind of in raised relief as they appear in this image. The other thing that it does is, in some cases, it, it erodes away the berries. And remember the way these new berries are structured. They're harder on the outside. They're softer in the middle. So imagine you've got this, this hard outer shell, and it's being sandblasted. And then at some point, you break through it into the softer stuff underneath. That erodes away quickly. And so what you wind up with is a berry that looks like it's been cut in half with a hard outer shell and, then, and a soft, hollowed out center. So you, you've got a, the, 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 the new berries are embedded in the soft matrix, but the way that it appears when you look at a natural surface like this is that you, uh, you get this kind of lumpy, eroded surface. One of the things that we could do, we haven't done it yet, we could try using our rock abrasion tool on this stuff. Cut into it, polish it, see what we see. We haven't done that yet. Uh, there are the fine grain, grain material in which they're embedded would that be a clay mineral? Well, I think, I think that what you're seeing here in the matrix, again, this is a hypothesis we yeah. will test as we do these multiple measurements, right? But I think what you're seeing here, I think this matrix is the whitewater lake clay bearing stuff. And there are some places where there's a high concentration of new berries, some places where there's a much lower concentration. But you know, our working hypothesis right now is that everywhere the matrix, the fine grain stuff, has the composition that we measure at whitewater lake and then it's got these little new berries distributed through it. And that, that Whitewater Lake stuff, uh, that clay, is where the evidence shows that the water is not acidic? Yeah, this is, this is the unit that matches up so well with the clay signature that we see from orbit, and that clay signature tells us water with a neutral pH, exactly. Uh, if I can ask you a question about the formation of those sphericals, possible formation. Uh, on Earth, if they were from volcanic origin, mm -hmm. uh, could you correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes the sphericals are formed in association with atmospheric moisture? Yeah, that's true. Uh, atmospheric moisture can play a role uh, in helping um, these lapilli, uh, these little volcanic hailstones to kind of glom together. I, there's, I mean, there's it's perfectly reasonable to, suspo to suspect that in the presence of a big volcanic explosion or a big uh, impact on early Mars, you might have some water vapor present. Certainly, there's, there's ample evidence for, for water being present at the surface and below the surface on early Mars. So I, I have no problem with that as, as being. I, I certainly wouldn't use that fact to rule out the idea that these are accretion or lapilli. I think it's entirely reasonable hypothesis. Okay, and not to induce any MSL envy, but how long does your APXS uh, integration take now? Uh, APXS integration takes the same that it always has. The, the, um, the APXS, there are th we have two different instruments on the rover that use radioactive isotopes for making their measurements on our rovers. Uh, one is the APXS, the other was our Moss Bauer spectrometer. The APXS uses curium-244 uh, as its radioisotope. The half-life of that stuff is, I don't remember the exact number, but it's a couple of decades. We still got plenty, so it's no issue. Um, <laughs> I think the one you're thinking of is our Moss Bauer spectrometer, which uses cobalt-57. 
Cobalt 57 has a half-life of 271 days, which seemed like a long time. You know, nine months seemed like a long time back when we were planning a 90-day mission, but we have been on the surface of Mars now for 12 half-lives. And uh, you do the math, we can't, we can't use that instrument anymore, which is a shame because it would be a wonderful instrument for definitively identifying iron-bearing clays. But we ran out of Cobalt 57 a long time ago, so we can't make that, that measurement now. It's an old rover. Uh, Rick Lovett, Freelance. Yes. Um, I'm trying to get a scale on that picture. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm what, sorry. What, describe that like what I, it would I, be I like I here. I apologize. <laughs> I should have given you a scale on that. The scene that you're seeing there, that, that slab of white water lake, it's about a meter across. And, and the close-up of, I mean, of the new berries. Yeah, this, um, this, this scene's about five centimeters across. So that makes the berries themselves, I, mean, I think you said a couple millimeters. of millimeters. Right. Yeah. Um, could you give a, um, you know, what, a, a, a household object that might look like that, sir? Yeah. <laughs> You know, household object, little three, I don't have any of those around my house. Um, yeah, they're sort of like BBs. Peas. Uh, peas, yeah, except they're not green. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, little, little gray spherical objects. Uh, you know, they're sort of like this, they're sort of like the size of, you know, when you go backpacking and you pick wild blueberries, not the big juicy ones you get in the grocery store, but the really tasty ones that you get when you're out backpacking in the mountains, they're about that size. You know, they're, they're like three millimeters in size. They're, they're, they're pretty tiny little things. Oh, we have another question from uh, Nancy Atkinson. Okay. When does the next winter season start? When opportunity has to start hunkering down and try to make it through another winter? And how optimistic are you that the rover can make it through another winter? <laughs> Well, um, let's see, I did not look that data up. I think we've got about, about six months before we start serious winter planning. Um, it all depends on the dust buildup on the solar panels, which are controlled by the winds. And then based on that, we'll find appropriate tilts to optimize the solar panels. So um, right now, we don't have any reason to expect not to survive the the winter, but in, it's, a, it's a dynamic situation that we pay a lot of attention to. And we're already starting to look ahead and identify potential winter overing sites. Yeah, we have, we have months of summer conditions ahead of us. We're going to take full advantage of that while the sun is uh, shining brightly at our, at our landing site. It's worth pointing out that uh, last winter was the first time that Opportunity actually had to remain stationary over the winter. Every other winter, we kept going all winter long. What was different last winter was that we had more dust on the solar arrays. What we'll have this coming winter is anybody's guess. As far as you know, how long we're going to keep going, yeah, it's, we're nine years into a 90-day mission. We voided the warranty on this thing a long time ago. Um, every day is a gift at this point, and we're just going to push the rover and push ourselves as hard as we can. We have time for one or two more questions. Do we have any more questions here on, in the room? Any from the chat? Okay, that wraps it up. Thank All you right, very, very much. Thank you. Thanks, speakers, and thanks, everyone else. We're, our next press conference will be at 1.30 p.m. And it's an unlikely new tool for spotting clandestine nuclear tests. We hope you'll be back then. <laughs>